Hello and welcome to Hope Conference. Today we're going to be talking about Make Fashion EDU, a collaboration between two nonprofits, Steamhead and Make Fashion, where students combine fashion and technology in an outfit that they design from the ground up. And they learn design thinking skills, technical skills, practical building skills, and most importantly, they use these skills to express themselves and become advocates in their communities. Make Fashion EDU has proven to be a powerful entry point for students from all perspectives and backgrounds, but especially for girls who are hesitant and to engage with science and technology subjects. Again and again, we've seen fashion tech excite and activate students who wouldn't normally think of themselves as technical to start using technology as a tool, and it has alleviated their fears that tech is too complex or alien for them to understand. As well as on the other side of the spectrum, we've seen very technical students start out thinking that they're not creative and that they don't think of themselves as designers. They embrace this process and realize their power for self-expression. And if you ask any educator, they will tell you how hard it is to find classroom projects that combine this kind of openness and accessibility with a topic that excites their students to learn and explore STEM subjects. And Make Fashion EDU does that. Our first speaker is Make Fashion EDU director and co-founder Carrie Leung, and she'll be talking about empowering young people to become advocates. Next, Make Fashion EDU program developer James Simpson will discuss the different technological solutions the program has experimented with and developed in Shenzhen, China. And finally, Twyla Busby will share her perspective as a teacher working in the classroom implementing Make Fashion EDU and working to improve education from the ground level. Let's get started. Hello, Hope. My name is Carrie Leung, a lifelong advocate of education as change and progress. I've been an educator in various forms for 20 years. To me, it is very important to have the ability and confidence to change the world around you, to modify, to customize, to advocate. I'm here to share with you our method of how we take our students on the journey from being a passive consumer to a confident creator, to become inspiring advocate an inspiring advocate through fashion and tech, and of course with academic learning integrated into all of this. Uh, to quote, give me your tired, your poor, your hollow masses yearning to breathe free. A sixth grader just pulled that quote out of nowhere um, and she, she said it directly to me. Um, and this was uh, a member of a team that uh, created this immigrant rights project. Uh, what they wanted to do was express um, you know, this is why they're in America and this is their version of America. And a member of this team shared their family's story of incarceration because their father wanted better opportunities for their children. Um, he took a risk and it was worth it to them. And my student shared how it was difficult to cope with their father being absent, but also his incarcer car incarceration was due to the fact that he wanted more for them. And so um, this was a project uh, on, on Make Fashion EDU that um, really encapsulates uh, what we try to do in terms of advocacy. Um, here's another project, um, and quote, uh, this is a, a question my, my student posed. Uh, what does freedom actually mean for me and my family? Uh, what are my rights if this is allowed to happen repeatedly? Um, and she was posing this question uh, to the class, really, through her project. Um, because everybody wanted to know what she was doing or what that team was doing and what, what you know, why they, they're, you know, this is pretty graphic, <laughs> you know, why they wanted to express it in such a way. Um, this team prompted a heavy but necessary conversation or a series of conversations, whether it was guided by the teacher myself or on their own, um, within the class and, and eventually it spread within the community. Um, and so, you know, it kind of begs the question, why is it important that our youth becomes advocates? Um, I believe human beings want to do good. Uh, in my experiences as an educator, uh, I have found that our youth yearn to contribute. Um, they do not just want to be passive consumers of society. They want to be active participants in the world they live in. Sometimes they just don't know how or it isn't given the opportunity to. Uh, they want the ability to shape their world and experiences of others in a meaningful way. Uh, they want the confidence to speak up for themselves, uh, their needs as well as the needs of those around them. I found that they want to be empowered to make change and stand up for those that cannot, very similar to, I think, a lot of what we feel. Um, that agency, ability, and confidence uh, that I have found that our youth wants, um, that is advocacy. And yes, we build all of that, you know, do all of that with academic learning. Um, 
So, you know, to touch upon it, why fashion? Um, from Zoot Suits to the women's rights movement to the LGBT plus movement and uh, the Black Panther mo movement, uh, fashion has been proven a, a powerful tool to communicate values in an overt public way, as well as when necessary, um, a discreet code. Um, our kids like to uh, recall Hunger Games, you know, the ones that have read it. Oh, you know, it's like the Mockingjay. Um, and so, you know, fashion and what we wear is something that is, you know, ubiquitous as human beings. Um, so that's an easy platform uh, for ad advocacy. So through our experiences, we've noticed a natural three-step evolution as our young advocates discover their voice and their power. Um, so it starts with us providing them a safe harbor for exploration. A uh, physical, mental, and emotional safe space is, is necessary. Um, it can be a maker space, a kitchen table, anywhere. Uh, students just need to feel safe in order to be able to explore their own thoughts, feelings, and interests unbounded. Um, you know, not just with themselves, but with their peers or anybody in that space um, so that they can reflect. An example of this, uh, this is Corbin. Uh, you can see Corbin here uh, with his backpack. Um, he has created a, a backpack for when cycling. So when cars get too close, it flashes red. And you know, when there is a safe distance, it is a nice serene green. Um, Corbin found, uh, really found a way to engage um, in, in our makerspace. Uh, Corbin suffers from high anxiety due to his you know, extreme dyslexia. Um, he had a hard time engaging with materials in school or, or just sometimes just disengage. Uh, but in the makerspace, he was able to find um, and express himself in a safe way. And he was able to create something like this backpack. Lucas here, uh, you know, he has he has a he has a story about being bullied because he he's in, just interested in things that his peers uh, thought wasn't cool. Um, Lucas is an amazing artist, loves to design, loves clothes, um, and uh, you know with making fashion edu and in his classroom and in the maker space, um, it provided a safe space for him to explore his artistry and what he likes. And in in fact, uh, he does it so well. Other people in the space, come and ask him for advice. Lucas was really able to explore and express himself uh, through, through this. And here you can see some of the things that he has created. Um, so one, you know, provide a safe harbor for exploration for your, for your students. Uh, I just, that's really important. Uh, two, uh, guide them to the resources to create. Right. Uh, once the students discover their thoughts, uh, we have to give them access to tools, knowledge, and resources to bring their ideas into the physical realm. You know, with without those tools and those, that access and that coaching and support and mentoring, um, they're they're not able to, you know, take their imagination into the real world to show. So here I have Haley. Um, me and Haley have had a, a long working relationship. Um, and Haley is one of our uh, oldest veterans of Make Fashion EDU. Um, here you can see her pictures of the runway. Um, Haley hates math, hates science, uh, just, just never thought she could do it, didn't think it was important. But she was exercising all these things, you know, when she wanted to create her skirt, uh, when she wanted to create her projection hat. And um, you know, upon reflection, she found that uh, she can program. You know, she's a pretty apt uh, block programmer now, and, and she can do circuitry. And she had a reason to apply math, um, you know, in, in creating her things. Um, so, you know, Haley is much more confident in um, accessing tech and engineering and using science and math as tools to help her create what she wants. Um, here we have Angela. Um, you know, Angela came a long way. Here's a clip of her um, working on her carousel dress and she is uh, programming a micro bit to control servos because she wanted her cards and teacups to spin on her dress. Um, I, I don't know, is, is there more to say about that? Like, this is amazing. Um, Angela is in the fourth grade. 
Uh, so we have one, provide a safe harbor, two, guide them to resources to create, and three, uh, this one to me is essential, and this is where we often lack, is we need to help our youth inspire others by giving them visibility on a public platform. Uh, I feel like this one's so important. How impactful is your work of advocacy if no one hears it? By definition, advocacy has to be public. Time and time again, I've seen students lack motivation because they feel it, it doesn't matter, Ms. Leung. Like, why am I doing this? Uh, oftentimes in classrooms, uh, we do the work, but we don't exhibit it to a larger audience. So are, are my students right? You know, I can say, hey kid, great work, but you don't, you know, we don't have the time to share it with the world. I mean, by middle school, like, for all you middle school teachers out there, you know, they're thinking, yeah, yeah, my work matters, uh-huh, hmm. Um, so give them a public platform. So our most visible platform for our young advocates is our runway event. Uh, involves a, a separate venue. We invite the press. Uh, attendance is beyond parents that provide proof to the students that they are truly being heard and that their work is meaningful. Um, we also teach our young advocates the tools of multimedia and um, explore distribution channels within their communities, as well as um, using the distribution channels that we have on the Make Fashion um, EDU platform. Um, so here uh, is a proof of, um, of that. Uh, this is Ellington, and um, I'll let him speak for himself here. Fifth grader Ellington Reed made a colorful dog mask that has a meaningful message behind it. I want to impress like everyone is different and you should not judge them by their looks. He says his design represents acceptance and treating everyone equally. People are mistreating people and less negatively and I want that to change because like we should be all open mind for each other. So thank you for attending and finding your way to Make Fashion EDU. Through our experiences uh, with Make Fashion EDU and our ever-growing community, um, we have really seen the impact one student can make on themselves and their community. And, um, and, and that's, that's an amazing thing. That's, that's what we want. So um, advocate on. Uh, hi, I'm James, and I'm going to talk to you about how we developed custom electronics for Make Fashion EDU, and I'm going to tell you the story of how we got there, uh, how we began uh, teaching classes with Arduinos, and we moved up through tech and custom development, reaching out across our whole community, uh, business community, parents, teachers, students, to build something new and unique. Let me first tell you about how we started bringing technology into the classroom. We started with Arduino. And uh, it was really great, uh, grades three through six even. Uh, students hooking up breadboards, doing burglar projects. Um, and uh, we, we quickly hit a, a ceiling in terms of the students' attentiveness and their dexterity at putting components into breadboards. Um, but we still used it for a lot of different projects. Eventually, we discovered uh, a lot of cool PCB kits and industrial electronics at Hua Chang Bay. So we started using those, things like um, self-recording PCBs where you could, you could speak for 30 seconds and it would record your voice and play it back. And those had to be soldered together. Or industrial LED lighting that we had big LED control systems for that kids could still use and we would integrate into projects. So after doing a lot of uh, industrial LEDs, we got better relationships with Hua Chang Bay providers and started looking at what types of stuff we could develop on our own. In the middle of that, we discovered microbits. So microbits were great. They were uh, development boards with sensors already built into them, and they had make code block programming. So we spent a bunch of time on block programming, allowing kids to control this stuff. Uh, block programming was better than Arduino for classrooms. Not that students couldn't do the text programming for Arduino, but it was hard for teachers to walk around and be able to correct mistakes. You really have to read the code to figure out which parentheses is missing or where a semicolon should go. With block coding, the teacher could look quickly or also just, because it was developed for education, they could also just refer kids to tutorials and help them find their own solutions and their own, their own um, ways of getting their program running. 
So as we were getting deeper into coding and moving away from like soldering and stuff, we were also talking with, um, with LED factories about what types of different uh, materials we could put together that'd be easy for kids to connect. We, we wound up with um, these RJ45 connectors, uh, these big black kind of sharp connectors for LED strips and these semi-industrial control systems. So not for like a hundred floor skyscraper, but maybe for like a five floor building. And uh, that worked out pretty well for a lot of projects. And as we talked with the vendors at those stations, um, we were able to, to customize those pieces in, in just a little way. So a really good story is that we wanted to have USB tips instead of barrel jack connectors at the ends of these little LED controllers. And so we had to pay a little bit of extra, not much, um, but a little bit of extra to get those USB tips in. And uh, those, were, those were really popular. So that vendor started selling USB tipped uh, LED control boards to everybody else. And they became really popular. We wound up seeing them at a lot of different booths. And then our price fell down to regular price. So it was kind of a cool experience to be able to, to solve uh, a problem that we had without worrying about like patenting or commercializing it as a project. It was such a small solution, but to be part of that ecosystem that could just take it up, absorb it, and then give advantages to everybody, including us and including our students. Uh, once, we, once we got past that phase, we had gained some confidence. And at Steamhead's Makerspace, there had been a lot of people rolling through making custom PCBs. A lot of them were doing these as like art projects, you know, engineer artists. And uh, we were fascinated by that. Um, eventually some people got, got towards doing uh, KiCad tutorials. So a uh, special call out to Olivia and Casper, but a lot of other people. Thanks for sharing those skills with us. Um, we wound up making a lot of kind of fun PCBs as our initial trials. And then we started thinking about modifying the stuff that we used in our classrooms. And so we, we, we started working in larger groups talking about what types of problems kid ha kids had, where breakage points were on wearable electronics, and figuring out how to, um, how to get stuff through. Being in Shenzhen is, is great. It took about 48 hours for us to send a KiCad file to a factory and get a big package of PCBs back, you know, 20 bucks. Um, so we were able to make a lot of mistakes and quickly, and, uh, and we're teachers, so we could take them straight to the classroom and figure things out. And that's a really, actually that's a really important point, is we weren't just sitting with makerspace people and engineers figuring out how to solve these problems. We were bringing those boards to the classrooms, working with kids, and we were asking the kids, hey, how easy is this to put together? Like, where is this failing? What, what ideas do you have about how to make this easier? And so then we would bring that back, work on the design files, and do another iteration with the factory. That's how we got to a lot of the solutions that we use today. And we're still, we're still evolving them. So we still use a lot of block programming with Microbit, um, and we get a lot of depth there. And then we use these custom uh, PCB boards um, and get a lot of depth there. They're, they're a little bit separate, um, but we're really enjoying it because we're able to bring a lot of technology and engineering to kids that don't self-identify as engineers, kids that don't like STEM stuff. Um, but they're still able to use technology for different types of projects to tell stories and to advocate for the things that they love. So whether it is uh, block programming uh, with a micro bit or building out circuits um, with a, a low amount of soldering, but still a heavy amount of customization in the classroom with, with students, um, they are able to pursue these two different forms of engineering all while working on these make fashion EDU advocacy projects. So we're pretty, we're pretty happy about that. And, uh, it's actually attracted a lot of attention from a local industry. So uh, I think M5 Stack is a good example. They do, they do these uh, development boards that come in stacks and uh, you can brick them together. And they are, I think they're used by folks that have serious aspirations to bootstrap their own, their own projects, um, to develop pr uh, prototypes that they eventually will bring to mass production. And so that company came to us and they helped us work on uh, one project in particular. This girl wanted butterflies um, launching from her dress. And so they were able in their, in their prototype shop and then later on in their factory 
to make butterfly launching devices for her dress that they later on published on their website and they were selling hundreds of them within days of the announcement. Uh, we went to that factory with the girl. Uh, we worked on the problems that they had with their first versions. The butterflies weren't launching correctly. Um, it turned out some of the wires were, were difficult to plug in. So we switched the directions, smoothed off a few corners and, uh, and wound up making a second iteration on the project. So M5 and Maria coming together on the butterfly dress uh, is just a good example of how uh, industry and education, students and makers and parents are coming together to build uh, new, new things, new projects, new stuff that goes out into the rest of the world. Um, I think that electronics development was a lot more about community than I expected. Just having the skills to sit down at KiCad, that's what we thought we were missing. Uh, but we wound up pulling a lot of elements through to get these projects completed. Um, I was really inspired by uh, an event that we had at, uh, at Steamhead called a Game Jam, where people get together to make, uh, to make games. And it's not a bunch of programmers that get together. It's artists and storytellers and playtesters and usability experts, like a lot of different people come together to make a successful game. Same thing, it turns out, is true for electronics. So when you are going out to make your uh, custom electronics, make sure you recognize the resources that you have around you. So to wrap it up, we looked at how initially we brought Arduino into classrooms and we're helping kids prototype their ideas. And then we, we discovered micro bit and block programming at the same time as we started working on custom PCB development. And we've taken those uh, sort of in two different directions, making engineering and technology accessible by, by everybody, not just people who uh, self-identify as engineers. And we did that through them, through our, our community, all providing feedback and input into these products. Hi, my name is Twyla Busby and I live in Tucson, Arizona. I've been in public education for 25 plus years. Um, before that, I had a dance studio. And I tell you this because I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to make Fashion EDU and what I've seen it do for my students. So when I got my teaching certificate, I was hired uh, at a fine arts magnet school to teach dance. And we had a great um, art department, uh, fine arts. We had band, orchestra, visual arts, dance, drama. We had everything in beautiful facilities. Um, but what I started noticing is that students who would memorize whole scripts, put on plays, um, beautiful, make beautiful music or artwork, or uh, even with me that were creative dancers, were failing in their academic classes. And that, that just didn't seem right. We knew that the kids were capable. They just didn't, um, somehow they weren't motivated to do the thing. So um, I'd been noticing this, and then one day my uh, the drama teacher came and said, you have got to see this. So she showed me a clip from Oprah in which they talked about High Tech High, which is in San Diego. Um, so the next day, a couple of colleagues, a principal and myself, uh, jumped in the car. We drove the six hours to San Diego and took a tour. And that's probably the first place that I'd ever heard of the term project-based learning. But I could see um, that this is the thing. This shows that what we do inherently in the arts where uh, students have creativity and they have choice and they have the opportunity to perform and show what they've done. They always have this uh, goal in mind. That could happen within the academic world too or on the academic side of the building. So um, we went back very excited. Um, not everybody <laughs> jumped on the bandwagon as quick as uh, those of us in the arts, but um, eventually I uh, wasn't the dance teacher anymore. I became curriculum specialist and we started converting our school to a more project-based learning. Now, um, at the time when we did performances or shows, concerts in our beautiful theater, the, it was standing room only. There was, um, people would always come. There'd be a lot of excitement. Um, the students would feel it. They were glad to have everybody come and show it. But then nobody, none of the parents ever showed up for parent-teacher conferences when they had those. So 
Um, we kind of try to approach it this way. We are going to have a school-wide exhibition of learning. And so each of the teachers have got to come up with some way for students to show what they've learned, not just in the arts, but with an emphasis in the academics. So uh, some teachers just jumped on that and they felt free to create and uh, have their students create. And uh, other ones just, uh, they didn't quite catch the vision, but they, um, they, they did something. So um, they didn't think anybody would come, but we opened the doors and it was a super successful evening with uh, students talking to their parents, talking to strangers about what they'd done and and how they done how they had done it, what was hard, what was difficult, what they learned. So it was um, it was a very successful, and that just showed me that this idea that um, showing your work and talking about it gives kids that extra boost to want to do better. So um, fast forward a few years, and I uh, went to China which is where we met Carrie and Ben. And I don't know that I'd uh, heard the term making before, but I knew DIY. We were, you know, didn't have a lot of money in our program. And so we made our costumes. You know, I had the kids uh, sew and cut and we made our props and uh, from whatever, whatever things that we could find and, and do. So uh, even when growing up, we'd always put things together. It was just a, kind of a DIY um, anyway, so that, that wasn't a big mindset change when we got to the, um, the, the idea of Maker. For me, the electronics and the coding was something new, but I could certainly see the, um, the advantages of it. And uh, combining that with traditional uh, workman craftsmanship, is, that was just, I could see it. So uh, when, after my first year of teaching, I became curriculum specialist again, and um, my friend was the principal, and we decided we're going to have a project-based school. So, uh, so we did, and that's how we advertised it. And in that time, we um, came up with the slogan that every classroom a makerspace, because um, we wanted not just uh, teachers to send their kids out to do with specialists, but as they're thinking about how they're going to show their learning, uh, why not have those tools and the creativity mindset of the art teacher or the music or whatever. So um, we just wanted it to bring a part of the classroom, not just uh, the way um, it was separate, something on the side. So anyway, so we had um, presentations of learning and exhibitions of learning and they we would get 500 people to come, you know, not just families, but other people would come and uh, we would make the school look different. We tried to reframe it so that the the student work would be shown and uh, they wouldn't feel like they were just, it was another assignment in a classroom. So anyway, let me see. I retired from uh, there, China, and I came back here and to, to Tucson and that lasted about six months before I got a little bit antsy. So I knew um, the principal of an elementary school and so I asked him, you know, can I, you know, have anything for me to do? Can I have a job? And he's like, sure. What do you want to do? Well, I want to have a makerspace and this is what it is. And, you know, at this time, this was mm -hmm, three years ago, um, it started, you know, making and that was becoming more of an educational movement. So he was all for it, it you know, with the hopes that I could work with teachers and kids. So I um, started in February and I got you know, ask everybody I know for donations. Uh, I, I bought a micro bit so I could start uh, learning. Um, I'm still not a coder, but I sure know how to take other people's codes and uh, copy it. And, um, you know, to get just I think that I shouldn't limit what kids can do. So if I can get them started and they have the materials there, then, you know, why not let, let them go? So anyway, so I started in February and in May we had our first Maker Fair. It was small, but um, it sparked some people, you know, when I said, hey, just what do you like to do? Come and show us. So uh, we had teachers who do woodworking. We had um, uh, ones who like to recycle and some got their class. We got a, a neighborhood group that did robotics. So we just it was just show and it was fun. There was no competition involved. Everybody just came and talked and looked. And, and anyway, so from that spark, 
Uh, the next year, I had kids who would come before school, during lunch, after school, um, just to make things with cardboard. But by that time, Ben and Carrie had had the first Make Fashion EDU runway show. And we're like, well, let's, let's do that. Let's try that here in Tucson. So uh, we got to work. I only had maybe one classroom teacher I was working with, and the rest were just kids that were coming. Uh, I invited a, a high school that was nearby, and um, they got really excited. Um, my sister works at another elementary school, so she started doing it with her students. And, and we all wanted them to be able to tell their story uh, through what they wear on the runway, but also to learn some skills, to um, be able to to use those skills to create, to take what's in their head to actually be able to put it um, in the physical world. And, and I saw that happening. And my own biases, I thought, oh my gosh, these kids are not, the boys, they are not going to want to sew. They, uh, even though in China I had seen that that was not a problem here, I thought, ah, no, our culture that sewing is for girls. So I had um, some sewing machines that were donated and uh, the first thing in there, the boys are all over it. They want to know how it works and what to do. And um, then it, it just kept going from there. We, we had a great show and I'll never forget the little girl that came up and told me this was the best day of my life. And I mean, I had just because they haven't had this opportunity. Um, with my little uh, side note advertisement, our kids are tested too much and they have been told that they do poorly on tests, so therefore they're uh, not smart or they can't do. And it's just, there's so much time spent on that that these other skills that are actually gonna help them when they have these opportunities on tests are just put on the side. So. I, I can see the, uh, the kids gaining confidence. I had uh, one little boy who's in a, a special ed classroom for part of the day, but boy, he is quick and he, he sees things. He um, gets frustrated quickly and, and quicks and cries, but then he'll come back. And even just seeing him learning to crochet, you know, that took some patience on his side. But when it comes to uh, programming and coding, you know, he sees it. Um, I see a, a lot of uh, kids that, um, although they have great creativity, they've never had a chance to do it, and so they, they quit. They haven't uh, been persistent, and they don't keep going. And uh, because they, you know, once you do a worksheet or answer that test question, that's done, and that's it. So th this is something that we have created within our system um, to take that persistence kind of out of out of it, the kids and let alone give them any opportunity to tell their stories through other things. So, so that's what make fashion edu. Uh, I've, I've seen it. We uh, did our second show and the quality of the products was more, I had more kids want to participate, even some just as designers, not as models. And then the other thing that we added to the show this year was our gallery where after, um, after the show, after the last runway, when everybody walks around, the students all went out and stood by a poster that had their story on it, uh, you know, with a picture of their design and uh, the story printed on it. And they stood there by that so that people could come out and talk to them and ask them questions and take pictures. And, and it was a great success. I mean, I've, I've learned through each of these shows and uh, going to the one in China, how, how to increase not only the quality of the show, but the excitement of the students and to uh, help them not get stuck doing the same things, but coming up with um, more and exciting, uh, exciting to them and, and exciting to the audience uh, pieces that they do. Um, so for me also, I, I mean, making a maker fair, I always have to explain, and we still had a maker fair. And we were planning one this year up until uh, the pandemic. But um, I, I still have to explain what making is, make a fair. But whenever I say make fashion, EDU, and it's a runway show, people get it right away. And they're excited. And when I write for uh, grants or donations, uh, it's, they just understand, oh, that's great. They're learning uh, about coding. They're learning about sewing, traditional 
Um, what I love with my students is that it's also brought families in because they would say, my Nana has a sewing machine. It's like, okay, well now you can uh, show her how to use it and um, be a part of it. And so, I mean, there's just so many things that it has done and, and different aspects that, of course, I get very excited talking about it, but it, it's just a, a good way. You know, um, I thought it was going to be just girls, but I've got boys too. But it is a great way for girls who I don't think they're interested in technology because that has to do with robotics and they don't want to do that. But by making a... Uh, an, an outfit or a scrunchie that lights up or, or anything like that. It it's just opens the doors and, and helps them see uh, technology, their creativity. Again, like I said, persistence, um, sharing. They talk to people. They've been interviewed by a newspaper and TV. And it just is uh, such, a, such a good thing to do. Um, so I'm happy to uh, be able to talk to you and, um, and share my experiences. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to find out more, the speakers, as well as other members of the Make Fashion community, will be available on the Make Fashion EDU Discord server to answer any questions you have on a variety of topics. So please make use of the remainder of this hour to find out more about our program and learn from our experiences. Hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.